this is a really exciting topic for me, uh, how to get funding for your blockchain company, because as an entrepreneur, uh, I pretty much think about funding or the use of funds uh, every day. Uh, I run a seed stage uh, blockchain startup. I speak to a lot of venture capitalists and, and other investors in this industry. And so I, as much as you, are very interested in hearing from the esteemed panel that we put together today about how to get funding for my own blockchain company. You know, I thought maybe I could learn something by moderating a panel. So um, what we'd like to do first is have everyone on the panel, starting with Nico Matsumura, uh, introduce themselves, talk about them and their funds, and then we're going to ask some thorny questions uh, and get to the bottom of how you actually get funding out of these people who always ask at the end of the meeting when they don't give you funding, how can I help? So, Nico, how can you help? Yeah, so uh, my name is Nico. I'm with Gumi Cryptos. And, uh, you know, to answer the question of how do you get funding for your blockchain company, uh, talk to Gumi Cryptos. Uh, we're uh, one of a family of, I think, six venture funds that are an offshoot of a successful multi-billion dollar gaming company based in Japan. And, uh, you know, we have three investment professionals in the San Francisco Bay Area, all of whom are here at the show. So my partner's over there, Evan and Ray. So the three of us are here. And, uh, you know, we, we write checks. 250k to a million dollars seed to Series A, and uh, you know we are dedicated to this space, which is blockchain and cryptographic assets. So to just kind of answer that question very briefly, how do you get funding? You know, you pretty much uh, pitch us. Uh, you don't screw it up, and you have something kind of differentiated to offer. So you know, obviously I can get into much more detail than that, but uh, I want to be mindful of time. I'm Greg Gilman. I'm one of the founders of Science, which is an incubator and venture fund here in Los Angeles. Uh, we're almost eight years old at this point. Uh, we started our first incubator focused on consumer, essentially, uh, out of the 75 or so companies we either co-founded or partnered with entrepreneurs at the earliest stages uh, in. We had uh, a handful of exits for about $1.3, $1.4 billion in total. Uh, Dollar Shave Club, which sold to Unilever, was our largest success there. Uh, we got involved in the blockchain space six and a half years ago. At that point, it was essentially the Bitcoin space. Uh, built a number of operating businesses, uh, and when our bank decided they no longer wanted to be in the sector, our board decided they no longer wanted us to be operating those companies, so we shut them down, uh, which was the greatest destruction of value in the history of our company, uh, but absolutely the right decision at the time. Um, my partners and I all remained individually interested and invested in the space, and about three years ago we decided we wanted to create a blockchain-specific incubator. Uh, and in order to fund that, we actually did a deliberate securities token sale, which at the time was, I think, the second in the world. Uh, our friends at BCAP had figured out how to tokenize a venture fund, and we said, that sounds like fun. So we went on that journey and then decided to make our token significantly more complex. Uh, to, in order to enable our, our uh, token holders to be liquid with respect to the underlying portfolio companies as well as at the, uh, at the um, fund level. Uh, and we are currently incubating and investing in blockchain companies out of that vehicle uh, and investing in both blockchain and traditional companies out of our main $75 million venture fund. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Scott Nissenbaum. I am the uh, Chief Investment Officer for Ben Franklin Technology Partners. I am a reformed venture capitalist and a recovering entrepreneur myself. And um, Ben Franklin is one of the most active seed investors in the United States. Um, I believe we're the most active on the East Coast. We made 51 early stage tech investments last year alone. Uh, and our portfolio is now about 250 companies. Uh, we decided to open up what we do and how we do it to the general public. So we created um, a fully U.S. regulated, so there's no offshore uh, tokenized venture fund called the Global Opportunity Philadelphia Fund. We closed uh, 16 million of a 50 million dollar fund. And to answer the specific question of why you're here, move to Philadelphia. 
uh, because we only invest in technology companies in the greater Philadelphia region. Um, but we do a deal a week, and so the probability of us getting behind a blockchain company um, that is located building jobs, creating wealth for all of us in the Philadelphia region is dramatically higher. So see me after. Uh, my name's Tom Lee, and I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Fundstrat Global Advisors. We uh, advise uh, investors um, mainly in traditional liquid markets, but over the past couple years, we've uh, done the same thing within crypto and blockchain. So we don't directly invest money. Um, we help our clients understand the different use cases out there to help understand projects. And so that's probably the, the route um, you know, we can be helpful. I'd say it's, uh, I'm interested in being involved with this panel because you know, there's a lot of different funding mechanisms out there, whether to be traditional equity. I think you know, there will be a lot of equity projects. Um, but then there are, of course, NATO Cryptiv and you know, STOs. So I think there's a lot to talk about. That's great. So, so Greg, you know, you've got a blockchain fund and you've got a legacy fund. With the blockchain fund, are you investing in token only uh, in kinds of companies where there's not equity or has that changed since uh, the ICO boom declined? You know, I think when we started in uh, late 2017, we were doing essentially tokens only because the market was incredibly hot and liquid and you can make good returns for your investors in a very short period of time. Uh, that market is, as we all know, is long gone. Uh, we're investing predominantly in equities of these companies at this point. Uh, although we would, I suppose, theoretically in the future, potentially perhaps consider a token under the right circumstances. Uh, and we would certainly uh, invest in uh, tokenized securities of companies as long as it represented actual ownership of the company. Yeah. Hey, Greg, can I just ask you a sure. question? Um, I don't know if you can answer this, but I was really curious when you were saying that you had been really seeding and sort of supporting some of these interesting blockchain projects that you had to shut down. Are you able to talk about what you thought were some of the best ones or wish you had seen, you know, stay funded and sure. be around uh, today? That's actually pretty easy. One of them was a Coinbase competitor, and this was six years ago, and the other was a mining oh, operation. Oh, it was Binance? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, it was Binance, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. It, one was a Coinbase competitor that we actually... Don't tell anyone. <laughs> right. And the other was a mining operation uh, that we had free power included in our rent at that mm. point. So <laughs> it, was, it was a very profitable wow. endeavor, uh, not so much as far as our landlord was concerned. Uh, but you know, those were the types of businesses. And then we made inv supporting investments in companies like Coindesk and a bunch of the sort of infrastructure and media properties. And obviously, since they were not our operating business businesses, we didn't have to shut those down. Scott, I have a question for you. Since you are a fund in Philadelphia that invests in blockchain companies, um, are you investing in STOs? You're, you yourself are making, you're an STO. Yes. Are you then investing in STOs if tokens aren't available as an investment vehicle? Yep. Is a security token uh, a viable thing for you to invest in? And what's your feeling about that as an investable class in general. Yeah, and so we haven't seen one yet that we've done. That doesn't mean we wouldn't. Um, so we're, we're agnostic in terms of structure. Most of our investments start as convertible debt. The good ones end up as equity. Um, we've looked at, but haven't done safe notes. Um, and so we would certainly be open to the idea of investing. Um, we are investing for profit. So the idea of just having the economics through the appreciation and token isn't something we would do. Um, but understanding that the security token represents what is essentially a private class of stock in the company, um, then we would absolutely do that. So. so, Miko, you've talked about transparency as being something which is super important to you, and you think that that's revolutionary. Does, does a token-based company, either STO or just a coin-based company, does, that, does the transparency make it a more interesting investment for you? Or how do you feel about, you know, uh, information uh, symmetry in, in your investment decisions? Well, so, so my thesis is broadly what I call open source money. And I think one of the things that's badly flawed about the way people are reasoning about open source dynamics is open source is effective when you're dealing with a commodity, right? And so the point being that if you actually have a proprietary secret, 
then you should keep that secret and you should bring it to Gumi Cryptos and we should write you a big <laughs> check, right? Because, you know, that's how asymmetry has worked, right? But the point being, and the reason why I'm, I'm kind of saying that the industry has been bad about reasoning about open source is that there are these gigantic values that are being placed on infrastructure chains, right? And the thing that's really interesting about it is, is that their code is open source. So if they add a few, they could add a hundred billion dollars of value to the crypto ecosystem. But the question is, does their coin catch that value, right? Because, you know, if, if it's an open source code base that has an incredibly powerful innovation in it, it's going to be forked. Like, and I, I guarantee you it will be right? forked like many times. So yeah. We saw that with uh, uh, Wax, which was originally built on EOS and then forked to EOS. Exactly. exactly. Right, so, so EOS did all, did all the work. And then right. Wax says, oh, we need all of this. That's and right. takes it in house. That's right, right. exactly. So you you know, so people people will take what they can and I, you know, and I there's nothing wrong with it. But I, you know, I think that the reasoning has been bad about secrecy versus transparency and when to use what. But I think that's probably the biggest topic of our industry, right? Which is the entire concept of what we're doing is cryptographic, right? Mm -hmm. So the cryptographic concept is basically secrecy, mm -hmm. right? So the question becomes what is secret and what is open? And to me, the bigger question from an investment perspective is, what is scarce and what is common? So you mentioned, uh, if you don't mind, because I'm, I'm a finance guy, so the technology, most of it flows over my head. Um, but the reality is, I look at the SBO market, and, and the, the word that always comes back to me, which I'm not allowed to use for our fund, is liquidity. Mm -hmm. Transparency enables the ability to have greater liquidity, even though the US regulations don't allow it in the structure today. And so when you talk about investing in an SPO, to me, if the capability of knowing what the true fair market price of that SPO is because the market is trading it, that's a huge benefit to me as a VC fund because then I can choose when I get in or when I get out, if there is liquidity in that. Um, and so the major advantage, at least in the US, of an SPO, in my opinion would be the increased liquidity capability, but we don't have that yet. And so we're, we're sort of in that weird stage as an industry where um, you, you, you have all the advantages and you have all the promise. We all know what those are and there's multiple. It's not just liquidity, but, but ultimately for a VC fund, that optionality of liquidity is huge. It just isn't there yet. But, but so Scott, can I just throw a theoretical out to Absolutely. you? Since you're a, a living walking case of an STO, um, let's say that uh, one of your STO investors uh, needs liquidity, but at the moment, um, on the exchange, for whatever reason, like let's say every available buyer has, is not making a bid, so the price uh, has a huge aberration. So let's say it trades down like 80% or something. Is, or would your fund be in a position to reacquire those shares at a discount because that's a huge value capture? Or... Do you have something in place that would act as a market maker to stabilize the price? Because I, I would say to me that would be the only question because it's not a true reflection of your underlying assets, but uh, all of a sudden the Correct. liquidity the suddenly works yeah. as an And so we've had conversations with multiple secondary buyers of VC funds. And if you look at the secondary buyers for VC funds, their, their average is like a 40% discount. And that's how they make their money. They're saying, as long as I just break even, if I buy in at 40% less, that's great. And so the expectation is that the, the general market will be less aggressive in terms of that pricing. Could we step in as a fund? We absolutely could. The question is, do you, do you want to... Do you want to have that relationship with an LP that supported you in the beginning where I come in and they say, well, you're, you're going to buy this for 80 cents, you know, or, or 20 cents on the dollar? Like, you, but I invested in you. And so it, it's less of a would we want to. Yeah, I, I don't mind making an extra 80 percent, something I'm already operating on. But is that the right thing to do for my LP? Yeah, so what do you picture? Because it's as there's more the STOs, there's probably a greater probability of an exchange, you know, this type of illiquidity creating some of these aberrant prices, right? Yep. And then I, I guess, actually, I guess maybe the opposite, uh, you know, because if there's if there's less information asymmetry and you can see the underlying net asset value basis, um, you might understand that the value of the of the SPO is actually higher. And, and, um, and so be, because, you know, in private investments, information asymmetry is what produces the massive alpha. If you know that you that these guys have something amazing, but no one else knows about it, you go can with buy that. it low. Um, right. With the assets like what Scott is creating, you should be able to see through to the underlying asset 
if you believe in the underlying asset value, then you can price it appropriately. And, and so, and, and for me, here's the holy grail of what we're doing, which is every single investment I make is actually tokenized. Again, this is not what we're doing, but we're 10 years, 20 now, maybe. Every single private company that we invest in is, a, is an STO. I have complete transparency on it. I know there's a clear market prices. And then I can mark that to market on a daily basis. So if I can mark every one of my assets that's in the fund on a daily basis, then I can mark to market on a daily basis the fund. What is that? It's a mutual fund. But actually, again, I'm, maybe I'm not making the log. It, the logic's not making sense to me because liquid markets um, have true price discovery, right? Even an you know an ETF that owns a bunch of um, uh, a bunch of underlying publicly traded high yield notes or you know investment grade bonds that trade like water, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars a day. There's always going to be breakage, you know, like an aberrant trade that could trigger a cascade of either selling points or liquidations or margin calls. So wouldn't an STO then push it more towards I, the liquid wanna, markets world where some aberrant wanna, pricing could take place? I wanna, get, I wanna get away from like this abstraction, right? Because, you know, I think we're up here to do a job, which is to tell people how to get funding for their blockchain companies. Y'all have blockchain companies, right? So to me, like, you know, if, if I'm gonna comment on STOs, the debate that I wanna have, and I think audience probably wants us to have, is, you know, is that a good way to get funding for your blockchain company? And I would say this, I would say you got three options out, you got four options out there, right? Four options to get funding, you know. One of them is uh, damn the torpedoes and do an ICO. Like, good luck with that. Uh, you're probably gonna end up in Malta or jail, uh, or both. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the, the second option would be, that's you know, the, order. the second option would be STO. And despite the debate that's happening here, again, like the question becomes, what is the commodity and what is the scarcity? And I'm going to tell you right now what's happening is, is that we have awesome issuers and platforms that are effectively commoditizing access to STOs, right? So what's going to happen is, is STOs will be a commodity and they won't be a scarcity, right? Uh, now. There may be very specific STOs that are a scarcity, and the thing that I think, you know, so that will be interesting. But to me, it leaves two other mechanisms, right? The two other mechanisms are IEO, initial exchange offering, which I actually do think is a thing, and we are seeing those pop off with liquidity, you know, or VC. And the common theme between VC and IEO is diligence. Right? And the thing that happened in ICO is that diligence was radically undervalued and people were just throwing money at whatever. And I think what's happening with the pendulous swing is that VC and IEO are situations, I just talked to like Mo, the CEO of Seller, he just did a $4 million uh, Binance Launchpad IEO and it sold out in seconds. Um, you know, he said that the Binance diligence on his IEO was more than any other venture capital diligence that he ever saw, you know. And you know, we, Gumi Crypto's diligence that deal, Pantera diligence that deal, like you know, lots of good funds diligence that deal, and Binance diligence him more, wow. right? So the point I'm trying to, the, so the point I'm trying to make is, is that like, you know, those are your paths to raising funding, and those are my, those are my personal attitude towards sure. it. So, like, you know, so I kind of want people to try to fight. But wasn't the idea of an STO supposed to be that it was more liquid? That was, isn't that the It is, advantage? but the thing that's funny is the liquidity isn't there, right? Because the buy side's not there. Right. It's all theoretical at this point. So, uh, from my perspective, an STO is a non-starter currently because most institutional capital will not invest in it. And that's for no. a few reasons, right? One is it has higher carrying costs than a traditional investment, right? It's very easy to hold my shares uh, through Carta or whoever else is managing, or Vitalo in theory, whoever else is managing the cap table of the private company that I've invested in. If you give me a security token as an institutional investor, I now have to custody that token. And while there are a number of custody providers emerging in the US, uh, there are there is not one to my knowledge. But I think the deeper oh, no, issue, yeah, right. the deeper I, issue, I, it makes perfect sense. I, yeah. I totally follow. But what the you deeper issue is not custody. The deeper issue is is like offering something people want to buy. Well, right. So, but it, it, or something I, that someone wants to invest. If in. I, as an institutional right. investor, am looking at a company that's trying to sell me a security token, my first thought is, as with any investment, is the underlying investment itself good? Mm -hmm. Right? Is the business Bingo. fundamentally sound, and are they going to make me money? Right? If do, is this a 
world-class team executing against a large problem with an elegant solution that should produce outsized returns, right? That's what I'm looking for, period, regardless of whether it's a, a paper stock or whether it's a token. So, so let me put this question to you. If I walk into your office and I say, hey, Greg, I'm running this STO, yeah. Is that a gating factor for you, or would you rather say, "Hey, Greg, I'm I'm gonna run. I'm gonna I'm creating this company that's making an amazing new cell phone for kids." Well, which is which is a better which is a better way. What to I would tell you is, start with the business first, right? Yeah. I don't I don't care about the offering type until right. I'm going to invest. Mm -hmm. At that point, if you say I want to run an STO, I'd say, well, what I would suggest is you run a, an offering for Series Seed or whatever right. it is, and you have a future right to convert into a securities token mm -hmm. at the investor's option on a one-time basis to convert all but not less than all of my holdings into a token mm -hmm. in the event that a liquid market for these investments ever actually develops. So you're mm -hmm. basically saying that you would, you would advise them not to do that. Well, I would, I would say like most, yeah, you're, don't, don't you're, start with the method. you're significantly narrowing your pool yeah. if you say I'm only running a tokenized offering yeah. because most investors will not or cannot invest in it yet. And the promise of liquidity isn't there, yeah. right? There's yeah. uh, open finance and maybe T0 will yeah. get there, you know, like, but other than that, the exchanges themselves are not online. And where there, where there is trading, it's very thin and there's, the buy side isn't there, right? So you're asking, you're, you're hoping that I will believe your promise of liquidity when there's no liquidity, there's no depth of market. Okay, so what you've just heard here is Greg Gilman, who runs a tokenized VC fund said, don't come to him and pitch mm -hmm. the method for fundraising. The method okay. is okay. That is not. That's it's not, not about the method. It's about the company. But, yeah. but that's no different than if someone came to you and said, "I'm doing a safe note or a note right. or an equity round or an STO." Like that doesn't matter. To, to your point, it's do I buy into this business? Do I like the people? Do I think we're going to make a lot of money together? Do I want to work with them? And then you start to get into what is the optimal structure for me as an investor, individually, institutionally, to get into that. Mm -hmm. STOs, a lot of the promise aren't there yet today. Mm -hmm. But I would only argue that that the idea of me just holding a class of stock or me holding an STO, um, if you think about the long-term objective for most VCs, at least it used to be, was an IPO, right? And, and so that IPO, it was supposed to be a financing event, but really for, uh, for the VCs, it's a liquidation event. Right. And so could you say the same thing about STOs in scale? It's not the, you know, well, this audience is probably much earlier stage than what an IPO could do, but if you have, you know, a track record and you have that history and your STO eventually you grow to the point at which there is liquidity because there are enough buyers. You know, Facebook's pre-IPO sale, secondary share sale was almost like the, the amount and number of buyers. Now there was a lot of fraud in there. And, but, but so that, that concept of, I bought an STO really early, but because it's closer to that liquidity option, mm -hmm. it's closer to that transparency, it's closer to an IPO, and then when you get to the end, do you really need to have an IPO? So let me, so uh, let me before okay. we move off of this, I just wanna ask one question, see if we can get an agreement actually on something, yep. which, which is, uh, <laughs> which is usually what all panels are about, people agreeing too much. Yeah, yeah. Um, not us. So, so not us. Um, so uh, security token, basically just a digital form of a preferred share, right? Yes. Yeah. That's all it That's is. That's all it is. Right? With yeah. a couple of extra features, like maybe programmable liquidity or some other ownership capabilities. Yep. That's it, right? That is. Yep. What is so, it? So, um, nothing to it. Nico and Greg, I'd be interested in your answer to this. Like, are there s certain types of projects you've seen that are more suitable to be an IEO versus something that should be venture? Like, have you come across something where you thought one form made more sense than the other? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, to me, like, they're different diligence lensing. So, you know, there are things that are much more traditional venture, because when you look at traditional venture, you gotta read books like Zero to One and like Angel by Jason Calcanis and like The Hard Thing by like Ben Horowitz, you know, and it's a culture, right? So, you, you know, there are certain things that don't actually fit the, because VC is pattern matching, right? So it's just setting off a bunch of green lights and then flipping a switch, right? And so to me, if you're not fitting the pattern, if you're pattern breaking, you should probably find other sources of liquidity and other forms of diligence, right? Especially if you're kind of one of these kind of nouveau blockchain infrastructure things, like, you know, Silicon Valley is kind of hardly investing in stuff like that, looks like that anymore. You know, that's just like, you know, new consensus with performance type of thing. You know? Thomas, what are your clients asking you about right now in terms of what's, what's investable or, you know, what, and what advice are you giving them about investing in these classes? Yeah, I mean, our, you know, the universe we represent 
is traditional liquid markets. But some guys, you know, some of these hedge funds obviously do a lot of private. Um, so a lot of the names you guys mentioned, they're investors in. And for them, I think crypto doesn't make a ton of sense to them because they're used to value capture and monopoly building platforms. And I think it's harder for them to see that. So I think some of them are, you know, kind of leaning towards, you know, s some of them, I and mean, they're all drawing different conclusions, but I think some are just thinking that they do want to have exposure to the space, but they're not sure the best way to get exposure. And, you know, some may end up just buying Bitcoin, you know, um, others may end up picking up secondary shares of existing projects out there because um, they could be a down round and they're just going to be picking them up cheaply. And, you know, and some are interested in buying the next Bitcoin or next, you know, 1000X. And so they, you know, there's a, there's a couple projects out there. So I think people are taking all different approaches. You know, it's, you know, crypto to me just seems a lot more, you know, hit or miss, a lot of luck. And, you know, I think what's good is there's obviously a lot fewer scams out there. Um, but I'm not sure that a lot of things out there are that useful either. But I think, I, I think that brings us back to diligence, right? Because what I, you know, it, the thing that happened with ICO is that there's a lack of diligence and a lack of discernment and ether flying everywhere. And that was, you know, we got the result we got, right? And so the reason why the market is overvaluing diligence in the form of VC and IEO is that the pendulum's coming back the other way, right? So I think to me, like, you know, if you want to raise money for your blockchain company, like, be, will, be ready and willing to subject yourself to a lot of scrutiny, because that's, that's what the market is asking all of us to do. It's asking all the gatekeepers to, pr to, to produce more scrutiny. So question to the panel, investable or not investable stable coins? Not investable. Actually, we had one of our highest returns from basis from base coin. Is that because you because it was less of a loss than? No, no, <laughs> they, they 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 gave up and refunded. Small money. negative. He's excited. Small negative. They they refunded the investors' money because they gave up. Yeah, it was a great return. Right. Yeah. Uh, I would personally think that stable coins are not a very attractive investment, um, for a variety of reasons. Although the companies that issue them might be attractive investments depending mm -hmm. on how they're structuring their stable coins. Stability is a feature, right? Yeah. It's not, there's, it's, there's, what is a stable coin? It's a, right. it's, it's a feature of a thing. I mean, it's, granted, probably what's the use of it? everybody in the audience would have said yes to a stable coin at the end of 2017 mm -hmm. that paid them back the same value that they invested at that if, point, right? If they know. If they got one-to-one -one back on their money at, that they had at the end of December 2017. Sure, but uh, anyway, the companies that issue them might be might be interesting depending on their business models, but the coins themselves are not. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm an early stage VC, so the idea of anything stable is outside my area of investing. So. <laughs> nice, good answer. I have nothing to add. I agree with everything I've heard. <laughs> oh man, there you go. You were looking for agreement. <laughs> yeah, um, we agree. So what? So what is investable to you guys right now? What idea are you? Are, is, is there an idea that you all are hunting for and waiting and you haven't seen come through the door? So I'll tell you the stuff that I like. Like, you know, from our perspective, we are at the birth of the new internet and we have TCP IP and we have FTP, but we don't even have HTTP. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you what I don't like is I don't like late adopting verticals. So I don't like stuff that's like art or healthcare or education or I'm sorry, it's a lot of companies in here in all these different verticals. Like we like financial services. We do like core infrastructure. We like developer tools and platforms, mm -hmm. right? And to some extent we're getting interested. I mean, we like gaming and you know, we happen to have, uh, Gumi is a multi-billion dollar game company. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we're interested in that. We think those are early adopters, right? Cause we think, we think it's early, that's, that's, that's why. I think generally uh, the thing I'm looking for most at this point are, is a company that is focused on actual commercialization uh, and has a plan to get there and has a front end that a user might actually use. I think my dream investment in the blockchain space is a company that when mass consumers use their product or service, they don't realize they're using a blockchain based business. Mm -hmm. uh, like any company that's out there saying, all right, so then you scatter or MetaMask is 100% not what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. 
right? Like, <laughs> I want the Netflix equivalent of a blockchain business, right? Yeah. So that a consumer can go in and have a great experience and not have to worry about how Netflix is opening a port in order to deliver their service, right? Like, nobody gives a shit about that. Mm -hmm. What they care about is a great product or service, not the underlying technology. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a, a general uh, observation on that, that question, which is VCs in general, um, there's two types. There's the checklist VC, you know, uh, management team, marketplace, technology, and you go through where are they, they match up my criteria, and that's what I invest in, and they're systematic about it. And then there's the love VC, and I use the equivalent of, you know, you, you, there's lots of beautiful people in your mind out there in the world, but you're not going to marry them all. And a VC investment in a lot of ways takes decades. Mm -hmm. um, that's sometimes, and, and you're falling in love. And so it's the people, it's the market. But when you sit in front of a VC, you could pitch 100 of them and you'll get two term sheets. Does that mean 98 of them are wrong and two of them are right? Or is there two that are smart and the 90 other 98 are idiots? It, it doesn't, that, that's just because you are about to marry someone doesn't make that person better or worse, it's just a better fit for you. And so I know that's a somewhat abstract way to think about it, but don't get discouraged because persistence when you're raising capital for any company, whether it's blockchain or not, it's about finding the right match with the right people that understand what you're doing, that can help and add value. But it is more of a falling in love than it is like a checklist, at least for, for, well, let me, for me. Let me press you on that. Mo most, uh, most early stage VC investments last longer than most average marriages, right? <laughs> Probably. Okay. So, and I know that it's against you. You can't use the word liquidity. Can you say it? Liquidity? Uh, I'm sorry, what? Liquidity. I'm sorry, what? Liquidity. So if you've got liquidity, okay, why does diligence matter that much? Why can't you place more bets if you're going to be, if you have potentially greater liquidity? Same. Why take, why, why not take, why, why not take more risk? Is it because you, you don't scale or what? Well, this is going to get weird because it's, it's, I'm going to keep with my analogy, which is it's like divorce, yeah. right? Like if, if someone else is going to marry the person I've already married, they've got to see what I saw, but it's got to be a lot better because I want mm -hmm. a higher price. And so the, the, the worst case is I invest in a company, I end up having to get divorced and it costs me half of what I put in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? The best case scenario is, you know, we, we, we fell in love, we're not getting divorced, but someone else is like, which is, this is the weird part of, you know what, I want to I wanna pay you to marry her instead. So yeah. maybe that's not the best analogy, but, but yeah. the, the idea being that liquidity only comes when there's success. And so it's easy to get into a deal. It's hard to get out of a deal unless, of course, there's success. So basically what you're saying is if you've ever been married, you'll never invest in a stable coin. Yeah, our, <laughs> our, our, uh, our general partner in Tokyo has a saying recently, which is uh, don't be Jeff Bezos. So that's on the topic yeah. of marriage. So, Thomas, I want to get back to diligence, though. <laughs> yeah, speaking of diligence. <laughs> um, Keep on flying. <laughs> yeah. You want to be Mackenzie Bezos. Yeah. Um, so, so what about diligence? You've got, um, in, in blockchain companies, the technology is often obscure, obtuse, lots of math. Um, it's hard to tell that some of the players don't have long track records. How do you assess a team when they walk in or a project, uh, you know, it, when you don't have the typical historical measures. Yeah, um, yeah you know, my background, by the way, is uh, as a, I was a technology analyst for many years, yeah. you know, in wireless, when there were only 34 million subscribers in the world at the time, um, in the early 90s, and today there's, you know, 5 billion cellular users. Um, first of all, I just think the mortality rate is gonna be way higher in crypto than um, other types of venture w projects because there's no expertise required essentially for someone to get involved. And so I think that the nature of diligence is going to be different because there's the value creation and the opportunity is all from the unknowns that have nothing to do with the team that you're meeting with and um, you know, and their capabilities and track record because some of it may be a consequence of the creation of a new market and then these guys happen to be, you know, very lucky and very early, yeah, so. Yeah, I, I disagree. Uh, I, you know, to me, like, I think what you're saying is you're saying it's like a dartboard and, uh, you know, if it, if, it were, if it were a dartboard, then, you know, VCs would be out of a job and I think they're not. Like, I think VCs are in, they're, they're, they're well, I mean, it just, it's, right it's, it's definitely an art board, because otherwise, how many projects were uncorrelated last year to the meltdown in crypto? I, mean, I think you're, to me, like, the entire market all moved 
think no nobody was a thousand x last year, right? Everything moved in the same direction. I mean, that's not everything. To me, that's a correlated. Not everything. Not everything. I think you're I think you're looking at the laws of large numbers and statistics, right? And VCs look at the law of very small numbers, right? So you know, very small numbers that become very large. Right, so not everything is correlated to Bitcoin. The, the fact that like many things were is just a sign of like, you know, poor investment decisions. But this this comes back to your come back to your question, which was how do we know? And and so you know, one anybody who walks into our offices to pitch, it's their job to get us to the point at which we think whether we do or not, we understand what it is they're pitching. And so the easiest way for me to leave a meeting and know we're not going to invest is I don't understand it. And that could be a failing on my intellect, it could be a failing on the pitch, or probably somewhere between, the, t between both of them. But if the person you're pitching doesn't get it, um, you gotta go back and you gotta make it understandable. And so there are technical pitches, there are business pitches, there's investment pitches, but the reality is knowing your audience and saying, you know, down into the dirt, because don't pitch me on the, the technical aspects of your coin versus this, because I'm not the guy for that. We have people in our office that have PhDs and they'll understand. Pitch me about how and why the market multiples and the market and the adoption rate and the recruiting and the talent is all there. That's what's gonna get me excited. And so I, I do think it's, a, it's incumbent upon you when you're out there fundraising to have a compelling story that the person across the table, whomever they are, can understand, because that's the first step. And then they can decide, well, I do like it, I, do, I understand it, now I have to decide whether I wanna pursue it. Okay, so that sounded like a lot of senior partners who spend more time on golf courses than they do in front of, I, I shoot with know. a 110, so it ain't me, so. Right, so, so do, you have, do you have associates, Greg, do you have associates that are looking at deal flow before you see it and help you suss out because there may be nuances, right, to some of these developments, uh, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. or, I mean, Nico, you kind of addressed it. Like, you said that in traditional VC, there's a checklist, you know, people. Right. But you said that there's no checklist in crypto because there's more things breaking the mold. I'm sorry, I'm not sure that's exactly how you worded it, but. No, 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 I don't think there's no checklist in crypto. I mean, we, we absolutely have checklists. And we also have, like, attraction to yeah. deal. Would you, s yeah. We have both. Do you, but is your expectation, though. like, so, you know, in venture, like, if you have an expectation, let's say, in your, in the historical record of, like, this is the percentage of venture opportunities that work, is your expectation that there'll be a better win ratio in crypto, or that there'll be a lower win ratio, but that the, you know, the winners are going to be that much stronger? Uh, I think that what's going to happen is kind of a converging to the mean, and I'll tell you the reason why, right? Like, for example, if you look at correlation of assets and you look at the slide, right, a lot of the anti-patterns that we saw is we saw big ICOs, huge amounts of treasuries in Ether, and then Ether going down by 90%, right? So that's the underlying correlation that caused them to tank, right? But we don't write checks in Ether. We write checks in USD, which is a relatively stable coin. Right, and so <laughs> from our perspective, we're not gonna have a treasury management problem in our portfolio as much, as much, right? So then what that means is it means that, you know, to me, if a CEO has raised money before uh, through the band that they need to raise, if they've scaled a company before through the band that they need to scale, and if they've exited before, like at some astronomical amount, then those are some of the tick boxes, you know, and then we actually have to like the person in the deal, right, which is the other side. But, but Miko, you said this other thing to me the other box. day. You said that most uh, entrepreneurs suck at pitching. That's true, um, especially in crypto. Especially in crypto. <laughs> so we've got a couple of mics uh, here um, for people <laughs> who are intrepid enough uh, and lucid enough to ask questions and maybe even do a 10 second pitch. Oh, who's, who's, who's game to, oh, there we go. We We've got, got a lucky contestant first, over here. First victim. Uh, no, not a pitch, but I do have a question. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Why? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Go no, so um, I just wanna summarize and make sure I got uh, the, Im the impression of what you're trying to convey, which is it's more about the business um, and less about um, the funding and the liquidity mechanisms. So I'd, if I were to summarize what I think I heard is, you know, as a founder, I for sure understand the need for liquidity, a liquidity event. Um, we're going to do this with investors so that they can exit. Um, all of that is why I'm here at this conference every year. 
But the mechanics of these things um, are outside of my space. And so if I were to come in after a pitch and say, you know, I don't know, you tell me what mechanism you want to use, would you find that way too casual of an approach to how you handle your I'm okay. I'm stuff? okay with that. I'm okay with that. If your business is like extremely sound, you know, if you have, you know, really the ability to extend runway with customer revenue, you know, if you're a solid entrepreneur That's with experience, question. like if you're yeah. like, I don't really know if I'm going to do an FTO or an IEO or if I don't know, you know, that's actually probably one of the best answers you could provide. Yeah, we're, we're, you know, fundamentally an incubator first. So we have to fall in love with you and your business before we're ever even going to think about putting money into it or how others should put money into it. And after we've done that and gotten to know you and help get the business on track and in the direction we think it should go, then when we sort of have high confidence and we're ready to write a check uh, and we think others are ready to write a check, we can jointly explore the best way to do that, which is, again, why I suggested earlier an STO, from my perspective, would not be ideal because you're just limiting the number of potential investors that can or will put money into your business at this point. And, and the only thing I'll add is most VCs, the, the prominent VCs, see too many deals, and, and it's almost impossible to dig in on all of them. And so the first pitch is all about getting to know um, for most of them. So when you come in and tell me, I'm going to do an STO, or I'm going to do a SAFE, or I'm going to do this, and I don't like that structure, that's easy. Thanks, you know, see you in a couple of years. And so the, I think your, your question of, should I come in with a great business and then work with you on what structure makes sense, I think that's a better option than coming in and telling me because I may like STOs, I may not. Like you're, you're not even getting the same consensus of the four on the table of what we like. And so I think coming in and then you know, getting us excited yeah. about the business and then working with us, whether it's an incubator or otherwise, to find a structure that makes sense for your business at the time with us, is a, is, I think that's a better option. Great. Good. Let's get another question yep. in here and then uh, we're, because we're running out of time. Yo, what's up, Miko? Greg, how y'all doing, man? Um, so I guess this is just to your point of like understanding, um, you know, what the company is. Um, you know, I was going to just talk a little bit about it real quick, but do you guys know, I mean, we've both had investment conversations about society. Can you speak to what, what we're doing or do you even have that understanding based on our previous conversation? Uh, I'm not going to do your pitch for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. We need to, add, we need a question. He can't pitch you. Okay, cool. See? I won't, I won't. That, but that was a good example. <laughs> um, I mean, that's, it's instructive, my response, I hope. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, cool. All right, I'll repeat it. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to get a little bit of idea from you, um, you guys. That I, when you talked about an I, uh, STO or an IEO, and it seems like you're really, really focused on just the U.S. markets, which is a super laggard. You know, I mean, I just got back from two and a half months in Asia, and, and uh, it seems globally that uh, there is a significant appetite for STOs and IEOs globally, especially in Europe and Asia. And because of the regulatory risk or pushback or the fact that there's been cryptocurrencies and blockchain investments have been, you know, uh, slandered pretty significantly here in the United States. And, you know, obviously the SEC has, you know, subpoenaed almost all the ICOs. Uh, do you think that it's tainted just because that you're focused on the U.S. market or do you think that it's it's do you, do you think that 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 the sentiment remains the same globally? <laughs> yeah. Nobody that's asked you. That's a good. <laughs> no, that's. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. So you're asking things of VCs. VCs have a six-second uh, um, attention span. So it's super important if you ask a VC a question or you pitch them, you're very concise because they get they lose they lose you lose them. It happens very quickly. To answer how to get funding, super concise. Well, You're, but I think the okay. question well, is Well, I mean, it's just the U.S. market versus global There you market. go. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, the, you know, the bottom line is, is yes. I mean, we're aware of differences. I mean, you know, you could refer to Groomy Cryptos as a, a Japan domicile VC fund. So we're aware of, you know, regional differences. Obviously, Asia has quite a bit of appetite for all kinds of things. But it's different, right? And to me, like, yes, you could try to play that game, but, uh, you know, ultimately it's all about, like, what it is that you're able to do, right, as an entrepreneur. So, you know, if you can get to Asia and you can do business there successfully, more power to you, but I'm going to be willing to bet that a lot of folks that aren't from there won't be able to. Can we get, do we have time for one more question or, or is the hook coming? 
Go for it. You've got time for one more. Got time. So yeah. uh, Steve and Eric from uh, My Bit Cards, uh, amen to what Greg was saying. We launched in uh, December um, a gift card, so a gift card that you can you could buy from any of the traditional digital or physical channels. That uh, the we're looking at getting mass adoption for the product. A lot of people want to buy it, know a little bit about, about it, but don't know how to actually buy Bitcoin. They buy a gift card, which 97% of Americans will do this year, and they will take that onto our website and redeem that gift card just the way that they would redeem a gift card for a brand store on our site for, for Bitcoin. We're live with two partners in the US today. We've just got a contract for 50,000 points of sale in uh, Europe. Uh, and we've also signed in with the biggest B2B reseller of gift cards for employee uh, motivation, uh, promotions, that kind of thing. Uh, I, uh, my quick re reflex on it is, is generally I like the space of gift cards. Uh, you know, really, if you look at websites, back in .com, it was how does my company get a website, right? So the question in this era is how does my company uh, print its own money? Mm -hmm. And it's already doing that. Like yeah. most consumer companies have gift cards, so they're yeah. already printing their own. Great money. way to plug. And so, like, that's a you know, they're going to they're going to, gift cards are a thing. Anyone? So I, I would the thing I would I would think about uh, or be worried about uh, in that case is uh, so if somebody doesn't know how to buy a Bitcoin, they buy a gift certi a gift card, go to your website and redeem it for Bitcoin. They now have to figure out how to hold Bitcoin, right? Which if they knew how to do that in the first place, they'd probably just go buy Bitcoin. Uh, but you know, generally, I like the idea of a gift card where you can start to give it out to people that aren't Bitcoin holders already. Um, and I think that was sort of, you know, Roger Veer's pl plan in the first place was just to go around and give them out so people would use them. Uh, but I think you, you have to think about what the consumer is going to do with that post-purchase. Yeah, so yeah, so we're so we uh, you want to go? I we have no more question. questions after this, yeah. unfortunately. If, if, so if, if you. you ask me, what's the most interesting uh, company in the blockchain universe that I would want to invest in today? It's something that makes the whole thing easier. Yeah. And so, if you're telling me gift cards make things easier, great. You'd have to convince me of that, and then you'd have to move to Philadelphia. But besides those two <laughs> things, we're from Philadelphia. Uh, <laughs> you couldn't tell from his accent; or he's from Philly. Or, or, you just don't know. So. <laughs> he's from um, yeah, I mean, but, but the whole interoperability, the whole usability, the whole, all of that is one of those, like, we all get that it has to happen, but we haven't quite figured out how to do it, and so that will be a big winner in this space the once someone figures it out. I'm sorry? The blockchain yeah. Yes. Very yeah. good. Thank you very much. Like email. Like she was going to pitch us if we gave her five more she minutes. She pitched um, us. So we're everyone, in. Uh, we're in. a round of applause <laughs> for our awesome panelists. Thank you so much, guys.